And we'll give Michael a moment to get dialed in, and today will be our day six of the Enlightenment uh, book from the Kabor's Manuscript. Uh, you can pick up all of the archives from this study on our website at whyagain.org, or you can pick them up on Podbeam, and we're actually recording live on both Blog Talk and Podbeam. So if you're able to access us through Podbeam, you can ask questions there in the chat room, or you can put up your hand. And so there's several ways that you can access this work. And we hope that you're putting the, the tools to work in your life and tell you all the time you don't have to believe it, but just put the tools to work and you'll see that they do. They work. And you can have clearer vision like Dr. Tim was talking about. And you can set up what you really want instead of what you don't want. You know, the focus of our statements, our words, tells the universe what to uh, send us. And we've even taught Aria, you know, to um, change words. And when we say something that is what we don't want, then she even says, well, cancel that thought. So at five years old, she's got that. And so, you know, she knows it works. And she said she's even doing that for the kids in her class, that they don't say cancel the thought. But if she hears them say something that she knows would be detrimental to them, then she says, well, cancel that thought. And so she does it for them. And we get her this afternoon, and we get to take our learning to another level because she always teaches us. And uh, so even though we're doing the study, if you have a question about anything, about the forgiveness work, about the process, about the enlightenment or whatever, um, press 1, 563-999-3581, and press 1. And that will lift a little hand, and we know that you want to talk and that you're not just listening. So Michael is with us, so I am now going to say welcome, Michael. Thank you, dear heart, and welcome, everybody. Delighted and honored that you're here and that we get to move to the next level of this amazing conversation about first century Aramaic forgiveness and all the corollary tools that go along with that process. Ginny and I had the uh, the blessing of an opportunity this morning to move into a new level of holding a space for what the world calls death. You know, we shared with you over the last year or so that uh, Ginny's dad passed and we were blessed to have him include us in his death. And we got to watch him literally experiencing the transition out of his body before he even left. And the sweetness of that space and that experience and how, though we would be delighted for him to still be here each time we look at each other and think of his passing it comes with a smile, and it comes with a profound sense of gratitude for his life and for his presence in our world. And then shortly after that occurred, I got to go out and spend some time with my son, whose mother, my former wife, was passing. And... It was late in the evening, and I was spending the night at the hospital with her, and got to be there once again, blessed by being included, given permission by her to be in this space with her as she left her body behind. Another powerful space that has been teaching us, and I have a sister who uh, actually just turned 80, in January, and has been through COPD, so many physical challenges, and last year found out she had pancreatic cancer. And she's in Canada, and under the uh, Canadian assisted suicide laws, medically assisted suicide, she opted to 
put an end to her suffering, I think a very, very appropriate decision for her, choice for her. And so we got to, unfortunately, we were a long ways away, so we only got to participate by phone, but... And if you knew my sister, <laughs> uh, whenever she didn't like something that was going on, she had this stiff, stiff-necked stance and had no qualms whatsoever about telling people what she thought. <laughs> and right up to the last minute, <laughs> she was just uh, right there with the doctors telling them what she wanted and they'd better get moving. <laughs> And so we got to be with her and her whole immediate family and my extended family, my sister, my brother, her children. And once again, just be in that sweet space of support for her to leave. And leaves me touched with this space of awe and wonder at human life. And, you know, they talk about how we were born alone. You know, that's a big lie. We're never born alone. Mother's there. So we're never alone in our birth. And then you talk about dying alone, which unfortunately does often happen. But that she made a choice to have her whole family there with her cooperating with and supporting her in her choice to end her suffering, which was pretty pretty severe. I mean, she wasn't far from the end anyway. And so it was, I think, a very appropriate decision for her to say, okay, I'm going to pull the plug. And she peacefully left her body about 10, 15 or so this morning. So I just invite you to join us in holding the space and... Um, if there's any energy for you, in you, unresolved around death, unresolved around loss and people leaving, we'll hold the space for resolution, we'll hold the space to bring those energetic patterns. You know, you look at the generations and generations and generations where death has visited in ways that were significantly traumatic and significantly insane that choosing a sane death was uh, my sister Alice's option. So I just invite you to join us in holding the space for her. As a child, she was very devout. And as she was going through this, I went back to a picture I had of her as a young, young child. And her devotion, her sweetness, and just uh, held that space all the way through this event in her life that brought an end to her physical, physical existence, but certainly not an end to her life. So, tuning into Alice and saying goodbye on the physical level and inviting everyone to join in holding the space for the healing of this terror and trauma that so many people carry around someone leaving their bodies behind. Jeanette, mm-hmm. do you have anything to share? We sat with them for about a half an hour on the phone this morning as they went through the whole medical procedure and her daughter was there. One of Alice's favorite songs was Ave Maria and so my niece was stroking her hair and playing her favorite song as she took her last breath and told the doctors what they should be doing right up to the last minute. Bless your heart, Alice. <laughs> so any thoughts for you, sweetie? Um, just that, you know, with her being as conscious as she was and making that choice, I think that even her, it gave a chuckle you know, when she said, come on, let's get this done, um, that her family could yes, realize you know, that it wasn't. <laughs> it was a conscious choice and that she was not the victim of the process. And so I think that will help give them some peace. I know that some of them still have 
some things that they need to work through, but uh, for me anyway, that was added an added piece. Yeah, I felt like uh, we were both able, although we weren't physically present in the room, energetically we were very present. And there are a lot of unresolved family dynamics with two children and dad and just a lot of stuff going on. But just to uh, to hold the space for all of that to be processing, I know, was an uplift for the whole family system. So... So I open the space if that brings anything up for anyone or anyone has anything to share. Push one. And let's talk about it. I know that the experience this morning has kind of left me in the space where I could just spend this whole hour with our show just in silence, just being in that space, breathing being that act of space of love. And you can tell you are breathing. (laughs) Um, We do have two hands up. (sighs) Cool. Let's say hello. (laughs) All right. The first one is Susan610. You're on the air. I'm just sitting with you that you went through this. Amazing. And I'm so glad you were open. You didn't think it was a bad thing for her to to decide to take her own life at this point. I think it was a very, very appropriate decision for her. And it's... Was she an extrovert? (laughs) No, no, actually she was kind of an introvert and uh, Mm -hmm. someone who most of her life carried a kind of a chip on her shoulder, as I say in my early memory. I have this picture in my mind that came to me last night. We did a vigil last night and I was communicating with different family members and sent out the invitation for everybody to just start that holding space of present love, the actual definition of prayer for her. Mm-hmm. And uh, being able to support her and the whole family through it. It's, it's just a very mm-hmm. sweet, sweet experience. It's wonderful that she wanted you around for that. And we got to talk to her a few nights ago, and um, the last thing she said before she got off the phone was, I love you and goodbye. And so it was, you know, really a precious time. But it reminded me of, you know, like Dad, right before he passed, of course he, you know, went on his own, but uh, he had not you know, rolled over or done any physical movement on his own in over a year. And he sat straight up in bed and his eyes got Mm -hmm. huge. And and he was actually, I believe, in the presence of God before he ever left his body. And they Mm -hmm. were going to bring him back. And and I told him, I said, no, don't. I said, why would you bring him back to a mind that isn't working the way he would like and to a body that doesn't cooperate? You know, he's at peace now. And it was kind of that same way with Alice. You know, she had struggled so much. And just in the past couple mm-hmm. of weeks, her physical body had gone downhill mm-hmm. tremendously. And it's like, oh you know, she was in pain and everything. And it's like, why stay? You know, she knew she was going to be passing soon anyway. Why continue mm-hmm. in that agony when you had the choice, which, you know, a lot of places you don't, but up there they did. Right. And she had the choice to go. And, of course, they interviewed her several times to make sure this was really what she wanted to do. And they even asked her again this morning, are you sure? And uh, mm-hmm. she was like, come on, get me out of here. You know, so. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. You sound like you're still a little bit croupy. Oh, I'm much better. I'm really all better. This is just leftovers. <laughs> Oh, thanks for asking. Yeah, it's just such a momentous thing. We are so expendable physically on one level. I mean, think about what God's creation is like. Uh, Bugs come and go and birds die and and animals come and go and it's all very fast and it's amazing and it's lavish and generous and what's the word? It's not only lavish, it's like... (sighs) Just... An incredible amount of abundance 
physical abundance coming and going. And yet each individual life, you know, I took a a stink bug out last night because I didn't want to kill him, but I knew if I, I did squish him, we'd have an awful stink on our hands. So I put him out the window. And I was thinking, here's this life which to itself is so amazingly much of a treasure. And and yet maybe I made that up. I mean, I don't know. It's, it just blows the mind hearing about your sister. It's this amazing event. And I'm, I'm amazed that you're on the radio show, but why not? I mean, what were you going to do instead? <laughs> I'm glad you're on. I'm glad you're telling us about it. It's just huge. And I love her. Um, her humor about it and her... Maybe it wasn't humor, but her detachment from it. Let's go. I had an aunt who yeah, did the she, same thing. Go ahead. Her, her whole life, her whole life, she would get into this. You know, she didn't have any problems at all letting you know what she thought about anything. And I have this visual of her from childhood of watching her like she would stiffen her neck and her back and rear up and say what she had to say and she was doing it with the doctors today before she, you know, just minutes before mm-hmm. the uh, the silence came and the heartbeat stopped. She was just, yeah. it was Alice all the way. And, uh, wow. you know, one of the things I hold the space for, for the planet, for the earth and all of us on it, I think you're very appropriate in the magnificence of life. And, you know, science is out there telling us, well, you know, you're just one little speck of clay on a speck of dirt somewhere in the cosmos that, Mm -hmm. you know, has been around for billions, and and you're nothing, you're just cosmic dust. Uh, And when we tap into the presence of life, even with that stink bug, it is a miracle. And we've been fed all kinds of falsities about our human lives and the significance of it. And to me, recouping the truth of that and holding a space for people to move on consciously without trauma Mm. is part of this work, is part of what we're here to hold the space for, for people who do choose to leave. That's so wonderful. I have an, um, I don't know what he is to me, an uncle, I guess, who has been on uh, no brain, no brain function much at all for many years, and he's using up all the fun family resources because they're keeping his body alive, and they'd all like to have him go, but they nobody does that. I, I wish there were per, some kind of permission to to hasten the death when it's already mentally spirit has gone already. We've been waiting for years for this uncle to go. And it, it seems it seems overly sentimental to maintain his body. It seems like a kind of selfishness. What are we avoiding? Feeling guilty? Anyway, that's a topic for another time maybe. Who you are going to the this very real farewell you just did. Amazing. Well, and perhaps you're going to be the space that can open the family system to being able to let him go rather than holding on to a shell where he's not even present. I mean, that's to me a situation. Well, they have. Michael, that's a mystery. He's hanging on. They've all let him go. They're taking care of his body because he's, he seems to stay in his body. What do you do? Stop fe- feeding him? Maybe that's what they should do. I don't know. Well, holding the space for the right resolution for him. Thank you. That's nice. Mm. Were you and your sister Sweet. close, Michael? In early childhood, we were. And in the later years, you know, when we moved, I moved to uh, the States and she was in Canada, you know, our contact wasn't deep. It was more occasional. 
Although mm. whenever I would be back in Canada, where well, there was always a Christmas event where everybody in the family got together and and spent Christmas Eve together. And uh, but I haven't been part of that in several years. So we yeah. were yeah. Uh, distantly close. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. I know you have another caller. I'll be listening. All right, dear heart. Thank you. Appreciate you. The next one is 541, I believe it's Celinda. Hi. Yes, it is. Susan and I, <laughs> bless our hearts. <clears throat> um, we, I, I wanted to say that, as I, you might have felt before, if I happened to touch on the on the um, subject, but I am grieving my brother's death, um, which is probably not too far off. And the doctor mm. came this morning, offered that third commitment of 15 commitments to conscious leadership or of conscious leadership. And it was very, very helpful uh, because I could have used a little bit of permission to go ahead and feel my emotions all the way through to completion. So I mm. thank both you for what you've shared today and um, what Dr. Tim shared today. In fact, I'm amazed at how often your two programs just dovetail with each other. So I wanted to thank you very much uh, for your graciousness and your commitment um, to living the Honored and delighted. And I hold the space that whatever thought disorders your perceptual system sees death through that you can resolve those and be with the miracle of this presence of love as it exits the body and carries on as before simply not in form and all of the I mean literally generations and generations of generations of traumatic deaths and pained uh, loss and thoughts that just literally cause the mind to, as with many events, to put a construct based in unresolved pain in the place of the actual event of someone passing. And that when we can dissolve that, I think we give the gift to that person of support for anything they need to resolve to be resolved prior to leaving. So I hold the space that you can offer that gift to your brother as he perhaps is getting ready to exit his form. Rather than being so wrapped up in my own pain. I think that's sweet. And also, um, as you well know, because I've talked about it before, my desire is to have a healing in my visual uh, on my eyes, um, especially for cataracts. And as you were talking, I realized, or I, I've been suspecting, and I've been doing worksheets around several issues uh, hovering around this center of loss and safety and death, um, separation of any kind. Uh, and what I'm feeling is that there's a direct metaphysical connection between that and my cataracts because um, ever since I was a young woman, I have noticed that over my left eye specifically, there has been like a filter. And uh, it would be, I remember the first time I ever noticed it was I was at a a swimming pool uh, on a military base and I just happened to blink one eye and for some reason I noticed that the other eye had a certain color to it and then I blinked the other eye and it had a different color. My right eye had kind of a bluish tint, you know, like a more clear, more uh, in in, uh, uh, actuality of how what I was looking at, you know, with my visual apparatus and then my left eye had like a sepia filter on it even at 21. And mm. I have, I really believe there's some connection 
metaphysically with that and loss and separation and a dark future and all of, you know, I, I've looked at Louise Hay and, and had some affirmation of, yeah, this would probably resonate for my energy system, what she says. And so uh, thank you. I just appreciate both shows this morning. And as I continue to work on my primary issues that I'm sure are multi-generational, multi-generational, I can see them in family lines on both sides, only yes. they reflect differently. One was the holding the space. Raid. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Oftentimes, I can use a lot of you know, space. <laughs> right, well, oftentimes, you know, it's looked at, looking from the left side of the body is reflection of some kind of conflict with female energy, your own or someone else's, and it can be a, something to, uh, pardon the pun, look into and see if there's anything to that in terms of what needs to happen to clear up your visual acuity. And also, uh, you know, a while back we did a series on different emotions and we spent a fair bit of time on grief. I don't know if you remember that show, but maybe Jeannie will uh, go ahead and put the links into the notes for today. Oh, that would be uh, wonderful. If anybody wants to go back and listen to that, we went into that fairly intensively. Yes, especially if uh, Jeannie didn't mind putting the links to all of those emotions because um, it's kind of hard to keep up with the archives. You know, like I'll write them down somewhere and then I will lose where I wrote, wrote them down. Oh, I want to go back and listen to this show. And uh, we, we do live over busy lives in our culture, even in the, in, even in the country. It's not we right. do call and right. come back here. <laughs> do you have a smartphone? So, yeah, I'd appreciate that. Uh, do I have a smartphone? No, I have a, um, an iPhone. Yeah, I have a, um, uh, an iPhone. Okay, so that's that a smartphone. Help? There's a mm -hmm. there's a free program out there called Evernote, and I mean you can do What's a paid version of it as well. Evernote, E V E R N O T E. Okay. And instead of writing down something on a piece of paper and then the piece of paper getting lost, you can set up a file for anything and everything that you deal with, and one of them might be notes for links to look up and you just put the note in Evernote and it's always there to go back to if you let's say you know the the archive page on that uh, when you go to it when you find it uh, you can actually just push a, a link or a button up in the corner of the browser and there's a little icon there that bang just shares it right to Evernote you can just put it right in and the whole page is right there connected to that set of notes so that might be a, a way to uh, help to keep those key ideas together and organized so so they're all yeah, yours and, and your archive shows I mean your archive shows with all of the incredible notes and URLs that that um, Jeannie puts in. I just really appreciate that because I love to go back and look through. And it's also very serendipitous where I usually put those notes is like in the way of mastery or in some, in, my, um, in my reference material for um, the RMA gospel. And, and it's kind of serendipitous to run across them and say, oh, yes. Oh, yes, and go listen to them or whatever. Yeah. Right. Thank you for that. Every Sweet. Time. All right. Yeah. Thank you Never so know. much. Yeah. I feel it's much better. Perfect. When I got on the phone, I, was, I could feel um, something well up, but by the time we finished talking, it was just like it was all smoothed over. And I thank you very much. It's just letting well, go, to me, letting the... go, letting go. Well, to me, the miracle of being able to, one, live a human life, live as the presence of love, and then to open to whatever is in us that needs to be embraced and held in that space of love. It, it's like, you know, for me, the definition of truth is truth is what is actual in the creation. And most people 
are not open to truth. They're only open to their mind's constructs that they call truth. And all of those constructs being based in the past are all based in a fraud. But when we are able to drop, and to me this is the, the core of the power of the forgiveness process, is that when you understand what drives pained perception and you cancel the goal that is driving some form of um, compromised energy into awareness that when that goal is canceled and the perceptual construct collapses, the ability to just open the space to allow truth, actuality, to come into your field directly and process you, come in to, you know, just like welcome it and whatever is out of line with truth when we're willing to breathe and be in that space, it just literally comes in and just reorganizes everything. So holding that space for you, dear heart. Oh, thank you. And you too take care. Uh, And um, I will be uh, on the show again, I'm sure. Thank you. Cool. Sweet. And we get the blessing of, when we finish the show, going to pick up Aria and having the afternoon with her and just being with that sweet presence of of love that is just uh, such a demonstration for us of who we really are as human beings. It was sweet the other day. We were One of the things she's doing, we're, we're teaching her to play dominoes. So and she's getting good at it, in fact. We we didn't finish our game the other day, but the score sheet's still there waiting to complete, and she is ahead of both of us. She's beating us at dominoes at five, and we have um, wooden stands for the dominoes, and we only have two of them. We have some others, but they've disappeared, so Jeannie was using one of the stands, and Ari was using one, and I was just setting mine on the table, and about halfway through the game, Ari looked over at me, and it's like, Papa, you don't have a stand here. And she took her dominoes out of the stand and put them on the table and handed me her stand. And it was just like, whew. Doesn't get better than that. And Sean is with us in the chat room, and he says he'll be in and out of the show. He's listening. Um, His wife is having back issues from a fusion she had done and said everything else is kind of getting backed up in his to-do list. So we hold the space for you and your wife, Sean, and that everything moves smoothly towards healing. And one of the things I would suggest, Sean, is that you go to Amazon and look for, let's see, how is it titled exactly? Healed by Sarno, I believe is the name of the DVD. There's a back surgeon named Dr. John Sarno. Oh, 60 years as a back surgeon. He passed recently, a couple of years ago, at somewhere in his mid-90s. And the last 30 years that he practiced, he did not use a scalpel. He taught people, and he has the best definition of back pain that I've ever heard of. And what he moved into teaching his people the last three decades, he practiced as a back surgeon but did no surgery, was that he would teach people that uh, their back pain was their unconscious rage. And I've had several people I've recommended that to who, in the, and I'm talking about people with debilitating, like I, I get up in the morning and I have to crawl to the bathroom because I can't stand up kind of back pain. One gentleman, it's actually a minister who's someone we've known for decades, and uh, he was laid up, had been laid up on several occasions with this debilitating back pain, and he was watching the video, and as he's watching it, he sent me a text. He said, Michael, you know, you told me this crap about pain being unconscious rage, and here I am writhing in my bed, but I'm watching the video you recommended. And he says, all of a sudden I have this thought that comes to my mind of this pain is just my unconscious rage. And he said, his quote, his text to me was, damn, my back pain is gone. 
I'm talking about the kind of stuff that had him crawling to the bathroom on a daily basis for months at a time over a period of years that he was dealing with this. So, so I might suggest that you and your wife, I think it's a $6 video, <clears throat> best $6 you've ever sent. In fact, uh, I think it sells for 14 You might buy it so you can watch it more than once. And uh, just just watch it and breathe with it. And uh, it's just, you know, his presence and his knowing that, you know, this thing we call pain is physical. I mean, he's really clear. He's not woo-woo kind of, you know, this is caused by your mind or this is your mind or it's psychosomatic. He's really clear. This is physical pain. And he explains the mechanism of that physical pain. And that is that when the mind wants to avoid its rage, it's smart enough to put it into, let's say, you know, someone says, oh, well, I wrenched my back and so I had an injury. And now for the next 20 years, this person, you know, believes that their pain is about their injury and the mind has hidden its dissociated pain in that tissue. And that when one can embrace that, again, the dissolution, and he goes through, you know, in his piece shows x-rays of spines that are just tragically messed up, and yet these people have no pain. And other people who have perfectly formed spines, and they live in excruciating pain. It's about the energy we engage in, and he explains the mechanism that <clears throat> this rage in the mind avoided, creates a tension in the muscles. He calls it TMS, tension mitosis syndrome, and that those muscles contract. And when those muscles contract, they cut off blood flow to the tissue. And in his thesis, at least, a 5% lack of oxygen to the tissue creates excruciating pain. And when I stop hiding that tension that's locked in the muscle, tension mitosis syndrome, I can embrace that tension, let it go, restore the oxygen flow to that tissue, and the physical pain goes away. So I'd suggest you might want to watch that and breathe with it and just see what uh, what opens for her. It's a powerful video, a powerful piece of work that he's done. And, and sadly, as an MD, I mean, he was light years ahead of his time, and one of the they actually demonstrate one of the traumas that he's gone through is the fact that he's, I mean, in the video there are several people, uh, like high-level celebrities that are part of the video and say, you know, I had this excruciating back pain, and I ran at John Sarno, and now I play with my back pain. Now I recognize that I'm doing this to myself and that I can stop it. I mean, there's just several celebrities right up to and including a congressman who held hearings trying to get this into the awareness of the population and yet those who live in denial don't want to own and deal with what they're doing to themselves so it becomes you know something that is going to be resolved by something physical because it's a physical problem there is no such thing as a physical problem because if you understand the physics of it, there is no physical. You know, if we listen to Einstein, Einstein says this, on such things as matter, we have been all wrong. What we have here to have called matter is energy, energy whose vibrations have been so lowered as to be perceptible to the senses. There is no matter. You don't have a material body. What you call material body is an appearance in your mind, and yes, there are energetic patterns in your brain interprets them in a certain way, but when you can let go of those interpretations and embrace the underlying trauma energy that reflects as the pain, then the pain tends to disappear. And the only pain that remains is that which we're unwilling to look at and deal with and process through individually and collectively. So I hope that serves and I hope that helps. And we we're... Have Oh, great. Let's go for it. Down to about 20 minutes. I believe it's Dan 757. You're on the air. Hello there. 
Hey, welcome, breathing friend. How are you? Hey. <laughs> You've been doing your work. You're in it. How's it going today? Um, it's interesting. I mean, I just I wanted to say hi, Michael and Jeannie. Let let you know I'm thinking of you lovingly with gratitude and you know listening to the whole show and just thinking of. Appreciate that uh, expression. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Now, you sent me a note recently that you are now at Worksheet 2000 as of a few days ago. That's pretty awesome. That's a commitment. Well, I've been homesick the last – well, I told you about I was texting with you a little bit about this. Yes. Yep. Um, The last four or five days. Yeah. And so I've been doing like 30 plus worksheets every day. Yesterday I did 60, which I've never, I've never done that many in a day and just kind of trying to root through this stuff that um, was coming up around the guy who's going to be my new boss. And it's just taking me into all these different directions. Awesome. Yeah. Well, and what most people call sick, I call symptomatic. And remember that when you think of yourself as an energy system, if you bring an energy into tissue that doesn't belong in tissue, then symptoms express. We live in a culture that says, well, if you've got symptoms, if i got a drug for you, we're going to anesthetize that. In other words, we're going to shut down that energy so you can lose awareness of it and pretend it's not there. Right. And then recognizing that when you step into willingness and you're ready to face all of these patterns that go back generations upon generations and develop the skill and the ability to embrace those symptomatic energies as they move back out, the symptoms of healing are identical to the symptoms of disease. It's just what direction the energy is going in. And from everything that you'd shared with me as we texted back and forth, you are right on track in terms of bringing forward those old energetic dynamics and those old thought disorders and and clearing through them. So I don't call that sick at all. I call it symptomatic and uh, in willingness. That's the the precious space where the healing process accelerates. It's been kind of awesome, actually. Um, And you said some grief might come up, and I think it's starting to a little bit. And... um, How does how does an energetic pattern get trapped into tissue to begin with? You stop breathing. When you so hold the breath. Instead of moving through. Exactly. An energy comes to pass not to stay until we hold our breath. And when the breath is held, we close down what was called the veil of the temple. We shut down this, we we create this artificial barrier between the subconscious and the unconscious mind. And, you know, in the ancient teachings, when they said the veil of the temple must be rent in twain, they weren't talking about a purple curtain in the church. The veil of the temple is literally the barrier between the subconscious and the unconscious mind. And so when there's something I don't want to deal with, close, tighten, lock, you know, right down yeah, yeah, to, yeah. you know, the, the tightness might be in your feet. The tightness might be in your calf muscles. It might be in your genitals. It might be in your, you know, your back, you know, wherever it is. It might be in your jaw. As you allow yourself to become aware of that and breathe into that tissue, then you get to process out what otherwise was in the tissue creating long-term degeneration. And this is how we eradicate degenerative disease. You notice the the suppressive mechanism of drugs. You know, these people don't do very well with degenerative disease. Like, there's no resolution there. The right. only real resolution of degenerative disease is, am I willing to embrace and process through this energy that I, and maybe a thousand generations before me, held my breath in the presence of and never wanted to deal with? Am I willing to breathe into it and embrace this energy fully in the presence of love and process through it. Well, that kind of goes along with, uh, you know, the things we do to ourselves over and over again because it's kind of like 
you know, if we find an energy unpleasant and uh, we want to avoid it, then we end up tensing up, clinging onto it, and as if to say, this is mine, I'll never let it go, which is right. the very thing Tension we don't, my don't want to experience. Syndrome. A la Sarno, tension mitosis syndrome. I create that tension, and with that tension, I hold my breath. I restrict the flow of energy through this tissue. I lock muscles, inhibit um, blood flow, cut off oxygen, and end up in pain. And pain is just my warning signal that I need to start looking inside as to what I'm holding on to here, and am I willing to process through? And and sometimes it might be right down to you know what appears to be, or seems to be real physical trauma held in physical tissue. And as I'm willing to embrace that, soften into it, and allow that tissue to be reorganized, literally break that word down. Yeah. How do you redo your organic structure? You throw off what was interfering with its perfect function. You embrace the symptoms that went with the dysfunction, and you heal the tissue. So, How old do you think instead of aging? <laughs> so as you were speaking, I was thinking of like willingness as a state of tissue relaxation. Exactly. And therefore, full blood flow. Way back in my early practice, I was at a medical conference. This was probably 37, 38 years ago, something like that. And it was on aging. And it was a group, a representative of a group uh, out of Cincinnati, Ohio. It was called the DeCourcy Clinic. And I heard this statement once from the platform this MD was sharing, the result of their research on aging. And here's what the De Courcy Clinic said, and this was burned into my brain. I've always remembered actually Jeannie found the exact quote, and it's slightly different from my memory, but this goes back 40 years ago. But basically what they said was, time is not toxic. Time has no effect on human tissue under any conditions. It is a belief in the effect of time by those who subscribe to such a belief that acts as a poison. And so if I buy into, oh, time means I deteriorate, it's just another way of hiding and holding my breath in the presence of those energies I didn't want to deal with. What we're inviting people to do is to strengthen themselves and step into the willingness to develop the faculty to literally reach into our own tissue structure, the cell, recapture the neuropeptide that created the chemistry of degeneration and be able to decode, process through in the presence of love that thought disorder that created the destructive chemistry in the cell. And the cell recoups because the cell knows exactly what it needs to do if we remove the interfering energy. So when we do forgiveness, you are knocking off, knocking this gunk off of the <clears throat> machinery of our bodies? Exactly. Literally, the energetic patterns in the cell that in the Aramaic would be called sin, remembering that sin is an archery term that simply means off the mark. If I put an energy into a cell that doesn't belong there, you know, the cell biologist, if we go to the opening words in the book of John in Aramaic, we're told that that book says in the beginning was the word and the word became flesh. But in Aramaic yeah. it says in the beginning was the mind energy and the mind energy became flesh. So if I've put a uh, piece of mind energy, which literally becomes chemistry in the cell, into a cell and create deterioration, Am I willing to develop the skill and the ability to literally reach into my own cellular structure and be able to recapture and decode that original experience, which oftentimes will, will not be a cognitive awareness, simply processing the disintegrative energy, but in many cases the full-blown memory will come up, and, and when I'm willing to pick it up and process it, I can literally remove it from the cell, and the cell in an instant recuperates. Mm, okay. Time is not toxic. Age has got nothing to do with aging. <laughs> it is the belief in the effects of time by those who subscribe to such a belief that acts as a poison. 
mind energy. Oh, time is toxic. I'm getting old. It must be time for me to deteriorate and become decrepit. Like, oh. But that's the game of the so, world. So if I hold it like a degenerative or a uh, disintegrative reality, an unpleasant reality, unconsciously, is that affecting every cell in my body, or is it just a certain aggregate of cells, or is it case by case? Well, it seems that we tend to hold different kinds of energies in different parts of the structure. That you know, uh, a few minutes ago, Celinda was talking about Louise Hay's book. There's a book out there by Louise Hay called You Can Heal Your Life. <laughs> And what Louise did over her career was she started looking at what tends to be the mind energy that relates to different so-called physical symptoms. And she's come up with a pattern of, well, you know, if you've got shoulder pain, that tends to be something along the lines of I'm carrying the world on my shoulders, bigger right. load than I need to be. And if it's my left shoulder, then I'm carrying a load related to either my own femininity or relationship with the female. And if it's in the right shoulder, then it tends to be, again, there's no absolute to it, tends to be something in the relationship to conflict with a male or my own maleness, my own male energy. And, and when I become cognitively aware of that, I'm empowered to go to another level of breathing into that tissue and, and literally bringing that full-blown memory, which might be, you know, something that happened 10 generations ago. There's a, a really powerful, and maybe Jean will put the notes in uh, on this, uh, there's a young lady named Magda who uh, did our codependence to interdependence intensive. And during that, we did a uh, the communication, responsibility communication practicum. And she was the, she and her partner were the uh, ex example of doing responsibility communication. And she was experiencing some heart difficulties, in fact, getting ready to go into the hospital for heart tests. And so her assignment in the intensive was to look into and to invite her ancestors to explain the conditions of their hearts. And she goes back into a full-blown memory and conversation with, if I remember correctly, it was her great-grandfather and how he came over from, again, if I remember correctly, I believe it was Lithuania and was supposed to be coming to America, the streets of gold. And the streets weren't so gold paved. And he ended up uh, literally digging a hole in the ground, wherever it was that they ended up, digging a hole in the ground for his family and his rage and fear at the crops not coming in and how he wasn't going to be able to feed his family and how that turned into abuse of himself and of his wife and of his children. And I mean, she had a full blown cognitive conversation of undoing those thought disorders from her great grandfather. Yeah. And as she power. developed and, and so this this is a woman who's been doing this work for the last twenty years or so. And I mean you you can just hear how she's reached a new level of being able to literally extract this genetic information and go into this conversation and clean up a whole raft of issues that had been stored in her own so called physical heart. Yeah. The powerful yeah. listen. To, to listen to her go through that and basically accessing and cleaning up the thought disorders, the energetic patterns that create the tension mitosis syndrome that causes a restriction in the heart and opening that back up again by being able to embrace that literally as I see it. You know, if, if you listen to um, Bruce Lipton, he goes into this dynamic of what, what he's showing is that when we think a thought, and he's talking from a cell biologist's point of view. When we think of thought, that thought becomes a neuropeptide, a literal molecule in the structure, circulates around in the structure until it finds a cell with a receptor site that matches, lands on the cell, inserts itself in the cell as what shows up as chemistry, and produces the result of that thought disorder in the tissue. 
and being able to, again, develop the skill and the ability to decode those energetic patterns and to be in the space of willingness to be able to breathe into those kinds of energetic patterns and to allow cognitive awareness to bring these things forward and to be able to breathe through them and let go of them. And and this is a skill, you know, when I look at my own life and my own process, that's taken decades to develop and continues on a daily basis for me to hone and and where I get the blessing of space that opens and I get to go, oh, that's what that's about. And then being receptive yeah. to being shown, without having to figure it out with my mind, being receptive to be shown what what happened, and all of a sudden, bingo, there's a full-blown memory. And holding, embracing that in the presence of active love dissolves it. Tension mitosis syndrome, the tension is now removed from the cell. Blood flow is restored. Pain goes away. And the cell recovers. Yeah. The cell reorganizes itself according to its natural pattern rather than this interfering pattern of sin, remembering that sin means an energy that's off the mark. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's awesome. That is a pretty it is amazing, awesome. amazing stuff. It's pretty and, sweet. Pretty yeah. sweet. And especially as you, you know, there's a, you, you find yourself and each person kind of finds their own way there where and one of the most powerful ways I know is through the still point breathing, as you've noticed, that's been pretty impactful. Yeah. And, you know, in the early phases, as you've experienced, it tends to be just all kinds of physiological sensation. What is this energy moving? I can't, I can't define any of it or figure any of it out. But as time unfolds, those energies that would have, in, in, in moving through tissue, would have been experienced as trauma, all of a sudden it becomes available as cognitive awareness, and I get to change my mind about it. Mm. And that's what the worksheet's designed to do, is to support that happening. Yeah. Well, I think it's working pretty well. Sweet. That's awesome, <laughs> sir. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm appreciative of how, of how willing you are and how committed and uh, and how your commitment opens a space on an energetic level for, you know, there's a great line in The Course of Miracles that says, millions yet unborn will benefit from the work you do. And those mm. 2,000 worksheets you're at, you know, the 60 worksheets you did yesterday, that opens a space of willingness for the whole planet to move into deeper and deeper sensibilities and being able to decode those energies rather than just be blasted unconscious by them and being lost in the generational pain. Well, I told you how, um, you know, it's just uncanny. Like I'm, I'm doing this work on the guy I'm going to go work for, which brings up, you know, issues related to my father and that sort of dynamic father, son type dynamic mentor guidance, right. childhood and, you know, wanting someone to love me, care about me, teach me, all that kind of thing, that branches out into all sorts of different relationships. And as I'm doing this work a few days ago, these people start to, to contact me and call me mm-hmm. and show up to, to resonate more stuff. You know what I mean? It's like unmistakable. You rang? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing how people start to come out of the work. You know, we do the um, book club uh, study of why is this happening to me again out of London, England. And the woman who uh, started the club, she actually has no idea how the book Why Is This Happening to Me Again arrived in her mailbox. She doesn't remember ordering it. She doesn't know where it came from. But it showed up in her mailbox and she started reading it and doing worksheets and like it was just a, a mega shift. And um, she had been separated from her father in the very early years of her life, like, you know, under 10. And literally at the point where we did a worksheet in the book club around parental energy, literally the next day, her father, who she hadn't heard from, I don't remember exactly, but in something like four decades, contacted her. And then at another level of work about a month later, 
her father, again, who she has only had now one or two phone contacts with, shows up at her door. Yeah. And she hasn't seen or heard from him in four decades. So, yeah, that's it's amazing. And, you know, again, a, a wonderful principle from The Course of Miracles, when you're healed, you're never healed alone. Each one of us that opens these spaces, you know, don't be too surprised if Dad's going to be calling you one of these days and talking about something that you've just processed through in a worksheet. Yeah. So, so with resonance, is there is physical distance has no bearing on, on the effect. There's nothing we know of in the physical world that can stop the high energy wave that leaves the mind when we think a thought. Okay. You know, if I if I have a radio wave, you know, it passes through the walls. Uh, you know, here I am in this room, and the, the walls are transparent to a radio wave. But if I put a, a lining of an eighth, an eighth of an inch of lead around the walls, I don't get a radio wave in here, but I can get an X-ray, which is a finer energy. And by passing through the walls, there is no – it is such a fine energy that there's no interaction with the atomic structure of the wood or the, the nails or what have you in, in my walls. And so I get the radio wave on this side. An X-ray won't pass through it because there is that energetic interference on the level of mind energy, which is the subtlest energy of all. There is nothing in the material world that can stop it. Time or uh, space mean nothing. It reaches anywhere and everywhere. That's awesome. Okay. I'm glad it to is. know that. Yeah, sweet. Well, the show is just whispered in my ear that we're complete. It's going to cut us off in a moment. So I'm going to say thanks for leading this conversation with your questions and your work and, you know, the, uh, the refined process that you're doing that you're sharing with our whole uh, audience that they get to build the brain cells out of the work you're doing. So thank you for that input. You're appreciated. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Create the best year yet of your eternal life. It's an awesome gift to give the world and blessings.